Okay, so I'm going to start off by just showing you the basic way we're going to sharpen a pencil. And this will be the same way we sharpen pencils when we get to carbon pencils and white charcoal. This doesn't change. Uh, white charcoal and carbon pencils can be a little more tricky to sharpen because they're not as hard as a graphite pencil. Uh, but it's basically the same thing. So with the pencil in one hand, your X-Acto knife in the other, um, pull back about an inch, maybe inch and a quarter, roundabout, and with the thumb that's holding, on the hand that's holding the pencil, you're gonna, with the blade almost parallel, but not quite, to the pencil, you're going to shave off the wood. And I'm cutting this at an angle. I'm not digging into the pencil. If I dig into the pencil, I'm gonna break it, okay? So, very carefully, just shave down to the graphite. And I'm gonna have this slope that gets created, because like I say, if I just dig down into it, I'm going to end up breaking it. I just keep turning and little by little shaving, again, using the thumb holding the pencil. And I'm going to expose roughly an inch, maybe a little more, of graphite. There you can see there's a slope. Hold it up there, you can see there's a slope down where it's not just dropping down, it's sloping down and I'm exposing some of the graphite. The advantage to that is we'll have the broad side of the pencil to use in addition to any point. So I'm cutting it with the uh, with the X-Acto knife, and I'm just using some sandpaper uh, to sharpen it. Okay, so I'm just holding it, and again you can see just kind of right along the sandpaper, and I turn it every so often. I just keep turning and turning, so I get a good point. As far as sandpaper goes, you know, 220 grit, 150 grit, I think this is 150 grit paper I'm using, you know, it's fine. So now we've got our sharpened pencil now. So I can use the broad side to block in the gesture, which I'm going to talk about here in a second, and then I can also use the point, all right? And for the majority of our drawing, we're going to be holding the pencil like this. In other words, with my index finger and my thumb, and we're holding it like that, and we're going to be pulling our lines, not pushing them, okay? Pulling them, and the, a lot of the uh, drawing will be using this broad side. Towards the end, the, uh, I hesitate to use the word detail because I don't want to confuse anybody, but when we get into the smaller shapes, more specific things, that's when we might start holding it like this to get into using the point, but I'll talk about that when we get to it. But for most of it, and especially in the gesture stage, we're going to be holding with our index finger and our thumb, and pulling our lines using the broad side of this exposed graphite, right? Um, so periodically stop and um, uh, sharpen as you need to, and just to keep things clean, I'd probably sharpen onto a paper towel. Um, having your pencil sharpen regularly is important. A lot of times people have problems with their drawing, and it turns out it's because their um, the pencil they're using is turning into a dull stump, and they don't have much to work with, right? So, um, I want to start off by explaining just the general logic of what we're going for here to kind of make sure nobody's confused or kind of break any bad habits, misconceptions that people have. A still life over to the side here, which in a minute you're going to see the video come up and you're going to see what my hand is doing as I'm drawing from this still life. But I just want to explain a few things. Um, we're drawing from life for all of our drawings, all right? We're not drawing from a photo. Um, drawing from a photo tends to kind of produce, I want to say, a lot of bad habits. There's things that uh, the photo does not pick up. Um, there are problems that you need to resolve in a drawing that if you have little to no drawing experience, looking at the photo, it's not going to really have enough information for you to resolve whatever problem you might be running into, and I'll touch on that further as we go forward. Um, but I, I do want to kind of address an issue that a lot of people misunderstand, and that is the idea that if you're drawing from life, like I'm going to be drawing this small pumpkin along with um, a box and a little green pepper here in a second. I'm going to kind of touch on the idea that, well, I'm drawing this representationally, uh, it looks believable, therefore all I'm doing is copying. That is not what you're doing. You're not just copying the image that's in front of you, um, which kind of goes again to the bad habits photography can kind of lead to. Sometimes people misunderstand that if they make their drawing look just like the photo, that that must make their drawing a good drawing, and that's really not the case. 
what you're doing is you're essentially, if I have to break it down to its, you know, some of the fundamentals of what we're thinking about, we're solving a problem. We're taking something that is three-dimensional and we're translating it into something that is two-dimensional. Okay? Because this paper is flat, it's two-dimensional. This object is three-dimensional. So in that process, there are certain things that I just am not going to be able to transfer over. Because if I make an exact copy of my subject matter, then I'm not making a drawing, I'm making a sculpture. Because this is three-dimensional, like I said, our drawing is two-dimensional. Um, so we essentially have to come to the, the conclusion of what is really important in our subject and what is not as important. We have to make very careful, calculated decisions and, 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 and choices on what's going to be included and what's not going to be included. And think to ourselves logically why we're including one thing and why we're not including something else. Um, and I don't mean to say we are selectively saying, oh, I don't feel like drawing this area because it's too hard, therefore I'm not going to include it. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about maintaining these decisions to uh, achieve our objective of creating something that is two-dimensional but has the illusion of three-dimensionality three to the image. Okay? Um, so if you think about that, like I said, this is three-dimensional. If I you know, have any questions about it, I can pick it up. If it's a still life that's a few feet away from me, I can walk around that still life, I can get up higher, I can get up lower. That's something I can't do in a photo. If it's a photo, it's pretty much set, and if I have confusion about what's happening in a certain area of a subject matter, an object, whatever the case may be, I'm not really going to be able to walk around that object or to pick it up because it's a photo. And that photo has essentially, you could think about the photo as a filter. It, it's certain things that just do not pick up in the photo. Uh, it does not pick up everything the human eye can pick up. Um, so you're going to have to think about this, like I say, as a problem. And I don't mean to say use the word problem in the sense that it's making it overly difficult. I mean, drawing's hard enough as it is, but think about it in a rational, logical kind of manner. There are certain problems we're going to deal with first, and that will lead us into resolving problems that we're going to deal with later. So don't try to juggle everything at once, I guess, is one thing I'm getting at. And I'll kind of touch on that as we go forward, but I really wanted to kind of make that point uh, clear, that we're not just copying what's in front of us. We're doing a very careful, observed analyzation of what's in front of us and an interpretation of what's in front of us to make it believable on a two-dimensional surface of our paper. Okay? So let me put that object back. And what I want to talk about now, and I'm going to do this in two parts. I'm going to do a quick uh, block in of explaining a gesture here uh, in the drawing. And in just a second, you'll see the uh, still life that I'm working from come up on the screen. After that, I'm going to do a quick, you'll see a quick little thing I'm going to splice into this of me talk, for, talking further about gesture um, uh, using Photoshop, drawing over top of something, so I can kind of clarify a little bit further. So, um, when I'm thinking of a gesture, I'm not thinking in terms of perfection or 100% accuracy. When I think of a gesture, I'm thinking of approximation, and I'm thinking of capturing the implied rhythm that's in my subject matter, the implied directional suggestions, the implied uh, general arrangement and relationships of what's going on, and then I'm going to gradually, as this drawing progresses, we're going to work on top of it and make adjustments and corrections. But the gesture is not about uh, making things look perfect. It's about getting approximate in, in, in the ballpark. It's about, again, feel, seeing how things generally, what kind of relationships objects are having with one another. Um, so I, I, I want to clarify that because a lot of times people um, struggle with this issue of gesture, which I'm going to draw in a second. And the, one of the most common things I hear in any class I do, whether it's beginning drawing or life drawing or any class involving drawing, is that somebody gets a gesture started, they don't like it, they stop, erase, and then they zoom into a detail, and inevitably I hear a comment of, well, my gesture wasn't accurate. Your gesture is not meant to be perfect and accurate. It's meant to be a starting point. A, 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 you could think of it almost as a wire frame that we're going to be adjusting and changing. It's just a, a loose foundation to build on top of. Okay? But at the same time, it's taking into account what is my subject matter doing as a whole together? What, what kind of rhythms is it suggesting? What kind of directions does it suggest? Does it suggest a movement to the left, to the right? more weight on top, more weight on bottom, what, what kind of general uh, alignment relationships are there. So keep that in mind. I'm going to block in the gesture now of this uh, setup. Um, and that's all I'm worrying about, just approximating things. And I'm also go going to be thinking of things in terms of simplified structures before things that are more complicated. Well, what do I mean by that? Uh, simplified structure would be taking something 
and simplifying it to its most common geometric equivalent. For example, that um, white uh, pumpkin. It's sort of like a kind of uh, elongated or pushed down sphere-like shape. Obviously it's more complicated than that uh, as I draw it further, but simplified, generally speaking, it's sort of like a you know, squished down sphere, okay? an oval-like shape. Um, so we could think there's basically four uh, geometric shapes we could reduce just about anything to in one form or another. So we have a sphere, which is what I just did here. I took the idea of a sphere and just squished it down to an oval-like form, which is relatively in the ballpark of what's going on with that um, pumpkin. We have a cylinder. We have a cube, which is what that white box is that has the pumpkin on top. A box-like shape, you could say. And we have a comb. You could pretty much reduce anything in the world to, those, to one of those four shapes or a combination of those four shapes. For example, a head, you could say, is somewhat like a sphere. We kind of say it's kind of like a little bit of what we did with this pumpkin. It's sort of like oval-like, so it's like this kind of uh, morphed uh, sphere. Obviously, a head is not a perfect sphere, but at a starting point, it's a good basic fundamental shape to get uh, a general start uh, going to a drawing of a head, if we were drawing a head right now. Uh, an arm is sort of like a cylindrical type form. Again, obviously it's not a perfect cylinder, but as a simplified starting point, it's something you could think uh, to use to apply to an arm. Uh, we could also apply the idea of a box to a head because we have a clear front, fa a front of a face, a top of a head, a side of a head, and so on. Um, for that green pepper uh, that's in the still life, it sort of has a cylindrical type form, but at the same time it has a very clear um, uh, side, one side versus another, so it has box-like qualities of one side versus another. Uh, and it also has a little bit of a cone-like aspect to it in the sense that it's a little bit wider at the base of it and it gradually goes to a slightly more rounded, thin uh, top. And obviously the you know, white box is a cube. Um, so when I do my gesture drawing, I'm thinking in, these, in this idea of simplified forms, simplified geometric uh, equivalents. Obviously I'm going to make it look much more ornate and specific as the drawing progresses, but in the beginning I want to think of something that, that's basic and, and, and easy to understand in my head so it's manageable and then work my way into the specifics of the subject matter. I don't want to immediately have this idea of it's instant gratification because drawing is not instant gratification. Granted, the more you do it, the faster you get at it, but even then you're still wanting to think in these logical uh, approaches and logical, uh, you could say, levels of hierarchy. One thing being dominant and another thing being subdominant, one thing naturally leading into the next, rather than trying to juggle everything simultaneously. All right? Um, so, oh, and here's also your eraser that you're going to use. I'll just take it out of the package. So let me erase these basic shapes here so we don't get in the way of our drawing we're going to do. I just wanted to uh, kind of have an idea of what's going on in my head as I block into still life. I'm also going to try to see that still life all as one big, like I said earlier, one big mass together. What are, what are the relationships there? So I've got the top where the stem is. I'm going to go all the way through the center of the um, pumpkin, all the way to the base where the block is coming in. Loosely assess that block. I'm going to come back up, reference that uh, pumpkin again, go right into a reference to the green pepper reference to the side of the block. I'm kind of referencing this block as it's somewhat of an angle to me. Again, nothing that I'm drawing right now is perfect. Far from it. But it's a starting point. Okay. So there's my general uh, gesture, my rough uh, block in. Okay. Obviously if I look at this and I, and I stop drawing right now, this has yet to really achieve fully what our goal is of having a completely believable illusion of three dimensions, but it's our, it's our wire armature, it's our framework, it's our starting point. We have things now that are referenced on our page that we can compare to one another. Which brings me to another point. Um, if you don't have your underdrawing down, what we're going to do here in a second with measuring will not work, because you need to have some type of uh, uh, reference to your subject on your page 
so you know how to calculate and translate the measurements that I'm going to talk about here in a little bit, okay? Uh, so remember, our gesture is thinking about approximating our forms, thinking of the general relationship. You can see there's this kind of curving kind of relationship between the uh, pepper and the pumpkin that kind of curves down into that um, uh, block. There's this kind of really straight uh, 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 vertical of the um, pumpkin as opposed to this diagonal of the pear, or the uh, um, pepper rather, and this kind of somewhat horizontal oval that's going on, but I'm drawing through the forms and I'm letting one object connect to the next and I'm not lifting my pencil off the page. So you can kind of notice as I did this gesture, I'm drawing very lightly because inevitably I know I'm going to correct, but I'm also letting my uh, marks and uh, letting each area kind of naturally lead into the next so I can see how they're all kind of functioning relative to each other, which in just a second here I'm going to show you this again just to reinforce it um, in, in a digital version so you understand what I mean. Okay, so just as a quick reinforcement of gesture on this setup, I'm going to do this with the red lines over top so you can kind of see it on top of the actual thing. So here's the, my highest point up here. I'm starting in, starting going right through the center of the uh, pumpkin down to the base of the uh, cube, up along the side, drawing through the forms, going right to that angle re reference of the pepper, drawing through this kind of sphere-like base, kind of organic sphere to this elongated sphere-like or uh, uh, shape, back to this corner, back up through the uh, vertical corner there, back around the top, back to the reference of the pumpkin. So this is all just gesture of, of generally what's happening. So let me flip this to green real quick and help re uh, reinforce this further. You can kind of see there's this movement over this overall setup, kind of this curving kind of shape. And then a very subtle one that kind of curves between these, the area of the pepper back to the corner of the, um, uh, of the box. And there's also a triangular type alignment among the whole setup as well, which later on can help me with measuring. Um, but I'm thinking of approximation, not perfection in the beginning. And I'm not being careless when I do this. I'm very carefully looking at what kind of shapes do I have as I draw through um, uh, this pepper, in other words. What kind of shape is it creating relative to uh, the cube, relative to uh, the, the pumpkin sitting on top? I notice I don't see the corner of the back of the, of the box. So this is the kind of thing I, I'm looking for. So if we take that off real quick. So there's the setup, there's my gesture on top of it. Um, so we're not looking for perfection in the gesture, you're looking for an approximation of all the subject matter you're seeing to together collectively as a whole. I'm almost thinking of it, even though they're technically three different objects, I'm trying to think of it all as one big mass form together as opposed to being separate things. If I start thinking of them as separate things, then I have more difficulties than I need to as I go forward to measuring how all the things relate together properly. Okay, so think of the whole approximate shape, the whole uh, uh, implied kind of gestural movements, which again, in this case, would be things like, you know, like I talked about a second ago, that curving suggestion, this diag diagonal projection, and so on, all right? Okay, so um, what I want to do now, and now that we have our gesture down, the general idea of what's going on, um, I want to start making corrections because obviously, like I said earlier, this is far from accurate, far from believable, far from achie achieving the objectives that we're setting out, which our objectives right now are to have uh, the image have accurate proportions, have the perspective uh, to be believable, meaning the relative positioning and space of it to us, to the viewer, uh, be believable, uh, have the shapes to be really specific and accurate as opposed to being generalized, which right now they're kind of generalized. So the way we're going to do that is we're going to do some measuring or some sighting. Some people call it sighting, some people call it measuring. Essentially, we're going to take uh, and cite how certain things are relating to each other from life, and then we're going to translate it back to um, our drawing. So there's three fundamental types of measuring, and I want to start out by saying um, that all of them are used back and forth. In other words, there isn't a process in this drawing where we're only going to use one type of measuring and then we're going to use another type and then never go back to the previous one. It's going to be a back and forth and I also want to say that as far as what to measure and when to measure, um, those are decisions you make in the middle of the drawing process. 
um, and I, I know this probably doesn't make sense just yet, but it will, but I wanted to be clear about this as we go into the measuring. Um, sometimes you're going to measure or check something in one way and it's not going to work for you. It's not going to resolve your problem. Well, that means you just need to think of another way of checking uh, something in a different manner to resolve the problem. And like I said, there's a few different approaches to it, uh, three different fundamental ways that I'm going to show. Um, so if one way isn't working, try a different way. And if that way is not working, try to resolve it another way. And every drawing you do, um, it's going to present you with a different set of problems. I mean, I could do this same still life, reposition the, the objects, and I have a whole different set of problems to, to deal with. I also want to say that there never really is one any all-purpose perfect spot to start at. Because we can have, always have a different arrangement of objects, different uh, organization of shapes. So you have to think logically, what, given your situation, what is the most logical thing uh, to organize and think and resolve first as opposed to something else. And generally speaking, I'm going to say think of your larger um, uh, relationships first and gradually work down to the small. But in terms of which larger ones seem to be the, the, the better issue, you could probably find two or three or four to start with that equally had that had equal validity in terms of what you would start with with correcting, all right? Again, I realize what I just talked about right now probably isn't making sense just yet, but as I do what I'm about to do in a second, it will gradually make sense, but I just wanted to start off with a, a little bit of an idea of the strategy in my mind. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to check the distance relationships, or you could think of these also as the height versus the overall width. And when I say overall, I'm talking about the entire overall width of this still life compared to the overall height of the still life. Okay, One distance relative to another. Okay, so the way I'm going to do that is I'm going to hold up this stick that I've got, which you could be using, this is just a wooden cooking skewer if you have a long uh, a knitting needle, that's fine, a chopstick, that's fine, whatever kind of straight stick you can find that's really straight, it'll work, okay? You could use your pencil, but eventually as you keep sharpening, your pencil obviously gets shorter. Um, so with one eye closed and my arm completely extended out, I'm not bending it, I'm having it completely extended out when I measure distance. I'm going to cite, you can kind of see the top of the stick is lining up with the top of the pumpkin, and my thumb is lining up with the base of the cube, okay? So I'm citing that distance, and I'm going to compare it to the width. So there's height, lock that in, I'm going to compare it to the width. It, the width is obviously a little bit wider than it is tall, so the height fits in one, now I'm going to move my thumb, my, my, my stick, to where my thumb is lining up where the end of the stick is. I'm not moving my thumb on the stick, but I'm moving the overall positioning of my hand. So you can see there's one. Just past the pumpkin seems to be where that's going to end. So one. Just a little under one and a quarter. One and one-fifth. Let's check that again. So there's our height. Um, you notice I'm not moving my thumb on the actual stick. I'm locking that measurement in. So the height versus the width that's fitting in one. Just a little over one time. A little under one and a quarter. So I want to see on my drawing, do I have the height fitting into the width a little under one and a quarter? So let's, let's see if I have that in my drawing. And if I don't have it, I'm going to change my drawing to make it flip that way. So there's the height in my underdrawing, my gesture. That fits in one. And that looks to be fitting in one and a quarter. It looks to be a little bit too wide. So I need to make this a little bit shorter. Okay. So before I commit to that, I'm going to recheck my measurement because rechecking never hurts. I mean, you maybe you made, made a mistake. If your arm starts to bend, you know, that can um, uh, uh, affect things. So for example, if I cite my height right now like this, and I don't move my thumb, but I bend my arm, you can tell I'm now fitting more in that uh, 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 stick than I had when my arm was straight. So if it's bending, I might get distortion. So I'm keeping my arm straight to make sure my measurement is accurate. So there's the height. And before we had just a little under one and a quarter, let's see if I made a mistake or not. So height fits in one just a little past that, yeah, still a little under one and a quarter, almost one, but not quite. One, 
a little under one and a quarter. So one. That's going to take me to about there. So I'm going to bring in this side of the um, uh, the box to here. And like I said earlier, that doesn't resolve every problem in my drawing. That just resolves one thing. Okay? Still far from accurate. But what I do know at this stage is that I'm not going to go any lower down in my drawing than that. I'm not going to go any higher up than that. I'm not going to go any farther to the left than here or any farther to the right than here. Okay? So I have a general idea of the parameters that the rest of my uh, corrections are going to stay within. Having said that, it's still possible that I may shift my height and width, meaning that maybe that measurement I just did, there was a, something still a little bit mistaken in it. And if that's the case, then I'll change it. So right now I'm thinking in my mind that I'm in the ballpark. I'm still leaving myself open to further adjustment. And if need be, if I find that something I did in this first, first height width measurement was wrong, then I'm going to change it. The other thing I want to say, and actually I'm erasing this little spot there because I know that's, that's inaccurate. I would not erase anything until you know why you're erasing it. So in other words, if like I can tell here this seems to be off, but I want to know specifically what's off about it and why I'm erasing it before I do that. Because even though it looks off, that doesn't mean that maybe something here is close to where it needs to be. So I just erased this over here because I know why I erased it. It was too far over to the left. I needed to push it back to the spot in the right. So um, don't erase until you know why you're erasing. Right? And if you're drawing lightly, like I said earlier, like that, it's pretty easy to erase because it's not putting down a heavy mark. If you're holding your pencil at this stage like this and you're digging in your lines like that, then you're going to have difficulty getting those to come out of your paper. Okay, so draw lightly, hold your pencil with your index finger and your thumb. Um, oh, one other thing I want to touch on about, about distance. It's another common problem that people have. Um, let's say, go back to this screen real quick. This, I've cited the height. What I would not want to do is go, okay, I've cited the height, and then try to bring back a measurement to my page. Remember, this is uh, about relationships, meaning you have to think about at least two things. So before I can take any measurements back, I have to have height, which is one thing, compared to the width. What is the relationship? What is the ratio? So one thing compared to another. And a lot of times I see students will they'll, they'll hold up a pencil like this without comparing it to anything else. They'll immediately bring it over to their page and they'll say they're confused. That's because they're not comparing things. They're only doing, taking one sighting and they're not seeing how it relates to something else. Also, I'm not looking to draw the image that I'm looking at the size it is in the stick. I'm looking to use the stick to find the ratio. How big is one distance compared to another? What I mean by that is I could draw this drawing 10 feet tall if I wanted to even though the subject matter, the still life, is clearly not 10 feet tall. But as long as I maintain that the height and the width have the correct ratio to one another, then the drawing can still be accurate and believable. So remember, it's about relationships. It's not about saying, oh, it's two inches on my stick, therefore my drawing needs to be two inches. It's about what is the relationship of one area compared to another, okay? Um, so that's, that's distance. That's one uh, approach to getting uh, measuring. And that's, again, so solving one aspect of our subject matter, but not solving everything. Um, ultimately, like I said earlier, you're ultimately going to find yourself bouncing back and forth between uh, many different ways of measuring, between distance, between angle measuring, which I'm going to talk about here in a little bit, and between uh, horizontal and vertical alignment, which I'm about to talk about. So it's going to be this back and forth. And like I said earlier, you're going to find that maybe you're trying to resolve a certain issue in a drawing and you measured the distance and for whatever reason it didn't seem to resolve your problem. Okay, well, let's compare it on another way. So another way would be on horizontal and vertical alignments. All right? sort of like longitude and latitude on a map. You think about it in those kind of ways, so using a horizontal and a vertical to see how one landmark relies to another. So if we go to this uh, setup, um, I can see right here, here's the top of my pepper. So I want to know how does the top of this pepper relate to the pumpkin? Does it seem to line up at the top, the bottom, the middle, where? So in my line of sight, holding up my stick as a straight horizontal and I can tell from here it seems to cut through roughly the middle of that pepper. 
Okay. So I go to my drawing. There was our pepper. There's the middle. So, and I say roughly because again, I'm leaving myself open to adjustment. I'm not commi overly committing to anything too soon. I'm just getting myself little by little closer and closer and closer to this more resolved drawing. Um, and one thing I want to say is do not um, uh, expect to do your drawings necessarily quickly. The fact the more you do this, the faster you'll get, but do not worry about speed drawing. In other words, once you get your gesture down, very carefully uh, think about these measurements. Your gesture you want to put down relatively quickly, but the measurements you want to think out clearly. So that's where roughly somewhere along this horizontal, that's where the pepper's going to be. I don't know where on the horizontal, I just know it needs to be somewhere on that horizontal eventually. So that would be a horizontal measurement. Right? I could do the same thing with saying, um, how does the corner here relate to what's happening with the pepper? If I were to go straight across, that's another horizontal I could do. It seems to me the, it looks like the stem of the pepper is higher up on that horizontal. So if we go up and now we're lining with the stem, you can see just a touch above the corner, horizontally to the right, we'd have the stem. So I'll go up. Horizontally to, the, oops, horizontally to the right, lightly putting in a measurement line. Somewhere along that horizontal, we're going to find the stem. Most likely, it's going to be in this area, but I want to examine it further before I commit to that. Okay? Because we knew earlier our width, our right side, wasn't coming any farther than that from our height width measurement. Okay? And if anything I'm talking about doesn't make sense, by all means, please let me know, and I will uh, try to clarify it in a, in a future future feedback video. Um, so that's horizontal, vertical, same thing, but it's vertical. So let's say the corner here. How does this corner, if I go straight up, how does it relate to the pepper? So there's my vertical alignment. It's on the right side, cutting through just to the right of center. I would say um, the first third of the pepper on this side is where it's coming in, approximately. Let's see, do I have that in my drawing? So the peppers or the pumpkins coming in there relative to my corner. And what about the other side of that pumpkin? That seems to be cutting through just a little bit to the left of center of this side of the cube. So here's this side of the cube that we drew in. There's roughly the center, a little to the left of center would be there, I go straight up. There's an adjustment for the placement of our pumpkin, all right? So I'm a little closer now than where I was initially. It's still not there yet, but I'm getting closer and closer and closer. You can also see by doing this vertical, these two vertical measurements, I've compared the two sides of the uh, pumpkin to the cube, which has, gr has gradually started to push me in the direction of getting the size of the pumpkin in the ballpark of where it needs to be. Okay, so that's why I say it's a little by little gradual buildup. So we've got horizontal alignments. You could even go from the corner right there. See how it relates to the pepper. We've got vertical alignments, seeing how things relate to each other. So those are the first two. The third one, and I would say probably the most difficult for most people, would be angles or diagonal measurements. Um, basically, that would be holding up your stick. Some people call it clock angles. I think as long as you get the idea that you're measuring how something is tilting at an angle. Uh, if I hold up my stick, let's say I want to find the angle right here. You can see this top edge of this box is moving back away from us at an angle. So if I hold up my stick, holding it uh, vertical to the um, corner, and I start turning it, I eventually have the angle consistent in my line of sight with the angle in the box. Okay? There's the angle of that top. Now I'm going to lock this into my arm and bring it back to my page. I'm going to just lightly and carefully block that in. It needs to come down a touch. And this is the reason I say this is the hardest one is because 
Well, a few reasons. One, it's very easy to cite it accurately, like I'm doing now. And then in that transition over, as I start moving my hand over, it's really easy that my arm bends and my wrist bends and I lose the measurement. So this is why I say you have to slowly work your way through. There's my angle. And if it takes me, if I have to really slowly lock it in, then I'll do that. And then I'll go back and check my drawing and then I adjust my drawing accordingly to find that angle. Do the same thing for the other angle here. And then one thing you don't want to do, if I'm measuring the angle, this uh, stick is right kind of vertical in my line of sight before I turn the angle. What I don't want to do is do something like that, where I'm bending it forward. If I bend it forward, I'm going to, not going to get a correct uh, angle measurement. I'm going to get distortion. So if we look at that from the profile view, this is how if my head is over here, I'm looking straight at it and it's straight up and down. It's not leaning forward like that away from me, all right? So when I go to measure this, I'm just either turning to the left or I'm turning it to the right. I'm not going back and I'm not going forward, all right? Because again, we're translating three dimensions into two dimensions, two-dimensional uh, interpretation, okay? Three-dimensional uh, setup translated into a two-dimensional issue, which means I have to almost imagine if there's a sheet of plexiglass or just glass in front of me and I can't go forward. I can only go to the left or to the right, okay? So, and it takes some, some practice to get used to this, so don't get too... Don't beat yourself up or get too frustrated if it takes a while. It's, it, that, that's normal. Check my drawing. There's the angle. Now, um, I can tell right here this is looking a little bit like it's tilting up a little too much, right? Uh, and at the end of this video, I'm going to show you some examples of how the positioning of these objects to your eye level is going to dictate a lot of what you do. Um, but this is one way of doing angle measuring. I'm, let's say I'm seeing something in my subject that it's moving away from me at an angle. I measure the angle. I very carefully translate it back to my drawing. And I check and I adjust accordingly. One thing to also note even though this drawing might look like it's flat on at the table, it's actually at an angle to me. I've propped it up against something. So if you have to prop your drawing board against um, a chair or against the side of a table, whatever the case may be, that's, uh, that would be good. Because if you have a flat drawing like this, let's say, and you measure something like that, and then you, you're going to lose your measurement as soon as you go to try to go back to that flat board. So you want it to be at an angle, and that's what, what's going on with my drawing board right now. So have it at an angle. Don't have it flat to you on a flat table. Like I say, lean it against the chair, lean it against the, uh, lean it against the table, but make sure it's not, that your board is not flat. Uh, yeah. Make sure it's not flat to you, but it's at an angle to you. So you're standing here looking at your drawing at an angle so your measurements translate properly. Because if it's like that, and you're standing here looking down on the flat uh, drawing uh, 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 pad, you're going to get distortion. So have it at an angle, okay? Um, so the, another way of thinking of measuring diagonals and angles would be finding landmarks within the whole setup that I can use to reinforce some of the earlier measurements, like our height and width. Um, this is sort of like a, you can think of it as triangulating something. Um, so for example, if I think of let's say the corner right here of this box against the corner right here on a diagonal. The only way to get there on a straight line is a diagonal. And then this point over to the top of the pepper right there is another subtle diagonal. And then this point back to where I started is another diagonal. I've created a triangular alignment. And if I can get all three of those points in the correct alignment with each other, that means they're all correctly in proportion, they're all correctly spaced, and so on. I can use those three measurements to help me find new landmarks, and I can gradually keep correcting my drawing. Another way of thinking about that would be, you know, if I have a triangle right here. Basically, I have three landmarks on that, okay? If I change that triangle, let's say the triangle is like this, I still have three landmarks, but those angles are different. And the other thing that is different is that the overall height compared to the overall width is different than what I have um, 
here. So I'm sorry, this is actually the height and this is the width. Play that wrong. So the width here versus the height here is different than the triangle down there. So by finding these pl the placement of these three landmarks to one another, it reinforces my earlier measurements while also securing landmarks that I can use as a guide to find future landmarks. So again, one thing leading into the next. And like I said, eventually you find yourself bouncing back and forth between all of these approaches. So I don't want to confuse anybody uh, into thinking there's uh, one specific one that's better than another. Also, this brings me to my other point that I talked about earlier. I just talked about I'm going to measure from here to here to here and then back again. With equal validity, I could start by measuring this corner to the top of the pumpkin to this turning point right here on the on the uh, pepper back to that corner again. Either one would be fine, as long as you're keeping your uh, mental focus in the right direction that you're looking for relationships and that you're going to build off of those relationships. So I don't want to kind of imply there's only one uh, all-purpose or just three all-purpose uh, landmarks and that any other ones would be wrong. We could probably find several triangulations thinking about this bigger setup and all three of these objects together that would all be could be equally valid. Which brings me back to, if this approach that I'm going to start right now doesn't work, let me find three other points that I can measure. See how they uh, start translating back. Eventually I find where my problem is. Okay? So that's what I'm going to do right now. I'm going to measure from here to here to here and then back again. It's roughly, not exactly a 45, but... So I'm bringing it back to where the corner starts, and it looks like that top corner is going to come down a little bit. Check it again. Yeah. Which would make sense, because I was thinking here that this might have been a little bit of a problem. So even though I measured that, I'm still leaving myself open to adjusting it. So for the time being, I'm going to say where this vertical comes up, it connects with that measurement. I'm going to use this landmark to check against the top of the pepper, back to here again, and then I'm going to backtrack and reassess what I did there. So I'm already kind of setting up a strategy. I'm already thinking about the next thing I'm going to do. So think of, I think this is one thing to always keep in, tr uh, in, in your mind with everything we do in the entire class. Don't think of the marks you make as a finish. Think of the marks you're making as a start, a lead-in to the next thing you're going to do, a setup to the next thing you're going to do. One thing is leading to the next. All right, so now I'm going to go from here to the top of the pepper, so here, the top of the pepper. Make sure that I'm not doing this, but I'm keeping it straight line. Bring that back, starting at that landmark. It's coming through there, and that was that vertical, uh, horizontal landmark we did earlier. So there's a good chance that's where the top of the pepper is. Haven't committed to it yet. I'm going to check it against this corner here, and we'll see. So, so far we have here, to here, and then back again. So bottom corner to that spot that I just found. And it looks like that would be okay. Right. So I'm going to recheck this real quick, that angle we did earlier. And yeah, it does need to come down a little bit. So I was a little bit off in that first one, which is fine. Make a mistake, you just correct it. So now I'm adjusting and erasing right here. But I know why I'm erasing it. Erasing it because it was skewing up tilting up just a bit too high. Okay. So there's our vertical and let me there we go. Just so the thing doesn't go out of focus. Sometimes that happens with the camera. Put this here to help keep it in focus. I 
notice everything is really light. I have a lot of room to adjust and correct. So we have one triangulation here. Now I'm going to look for a new landmark that I haven't found yet, but I'm going to make sure that landmark is based on comparing it to something I've already found. For example, this turning point that I talked about earlier, which is right there. I'm going to look at that point, compare it to this corner, compare it to that top of the pepper, which means I'll have found another triangulation that connects to the first one. Okay? So if this point can accurately be related to this corner and to here, then by default that means it automatically should be accurate to that one. Because these two relate accurately to here, and if I can get these two to relate accurately to here, then they should automatically be related. And if they're not, that means I made a mistake in my measuring, and I'll backtrack myself again. And then from there, I'm going to take that measure, those measurements, find another one, find another one, and just continue on and on and on, looking for, you know, and, and as I move through that, I'll be switching from maybe diagonals to horizontals. For example, if we go back to this uh, triangle uh, uh, example real quick. There's two angles, which you could say would be like two angle measurements, and there's a horizontal. Okay? Here's a very subtle angle, a more extreme angle, and a horizontal. If we had a triangular alignment of objects that was exactly like this, which would be that 90 degree angle, we'd have an angle measurement, a, a horizontal, and a vertical. Okay? So, vertical, or almost vertical, it's quite an angle, somewhat of an angle. So th that's kind of what I, what I mean when I say we're, we're kind of bouncing back and forth, okay? Again, if any of this is confusing, please let me know and I will I'll try to clarify for you. And I would also say pause and rewind as needed. Don't, don't think um, uh, you should memorize this in one shot. You're not going to memorize it in one shot. Um, this is something that takes a lot of practice, kind of like using, uh, using an, uh, playing an instrument. You're never going to just nail it in one, in one pass. So. That's the diagonal from the corner of the box to the turning point in the pepper. It's supposed to line up there. That seems to be okay. It's in the ballpark of where we thought it was going to be initially. Now we're going to go from here to here. And that seems to line up accurately. Okay. Now to test ourselves, what is the relationship from here to here? And that seems to line up, line up with what we, with what we want. So that means that it kind of confirms our previous measurements, you could say. Obviously, the gesture of this is going to shift a bit. So if I go up, you could do this again with the pencil, or I'm going to do this with my pencil here. You can see the top of that pepper just goes over a little bit. Let me put a you know, paper towel behind it, just in case you can't see the top of that pepper. I can see it, but I want to make sure you can see it on your, on your video. So just hold on a second. That's a little easier. So you can see there's the top, it's kind of a short straight line, and then that curve projects down, and then projects over again. So I'm using angle measurement to help me break down the straight line segment of the shape, and then on this side you can see there's another direction down, and it cuts down, and it cuts over, and over, and then down again. So I'm using angle measurement to help me make that shape more specific. Um, I can always round it off later. So as a quick example of what I'm talking about, if I break something down like this, even though the shape might be doing something like that where it's rounded, I can always round these areas off later. I want to first find the structure, okay? So real quickly, let's So I'm just showing, doing, you the, doing this real quick so you can see what I, what I mean when I say 
breaking down the shape. I'm worried about the curves and the rounded quality later on. And the, the more you do this, the more your visual memory is going to maintain it. Again, this is going to be very, very slow and time consuming in the beginning. It's one of those things you just got to kind of accept it so you get faster at it as you go. So don't stress yourself out if you're not you know, instantly picking this up. I think that would be an impractical expectation that you pick it up perfectly after one drawing. It's just not realistic. It's going to take you a while to get used to this. Most people it does at least. So it takes you a while, it takes you a while. It's not the end of the world if it takes you a while. Did not, I did not learn how to do this very quickly. It took me a long, long, long time. In fact, I would go as far to say is that you won't necessarily master this after one semester of drawing, especially with what we're going through right now. Uh, but it is something that the more you do it, the, the better and stronger you'll get at it. You should have a working knowledge of it, though, uh, as this semester goes on. So you can see I've started to maintain or build the shape of, um, of that uh, um, pepper. Okay, so we're going to do that. I'm going to take this spot, go to the top, take this corner, go to the top. Do this with a stick real quick. And then in just a second I'm going to start drawing and I'm not going to necessarily hold up every measurement. I just wanted you to understand what I'm going to be thinking when I'm saying I'm measuring this angle and that angle and so on. That corner. Somewhere along that diagonal. And basically where I take these two measurements and they go up to the top of that pumpkin, where they intersect, that's when I'll know exactly where the top of the pumpkin is going to be. So rarely will one measurement just resolve a bunch of problems. Usually it's a collection of several. Okay, and I want you to notice what just happened here. I did a diagonal from here to here, from here to here, there's the top of my stem. There was the top of my stem, my first pass at my block in my drawing. So I've just, through other correcting, found another subtle correction that was from a previous measurement. This is why I say I don't get committed to things too early. That needs to just come down. So if it's off, just bring it down. If it's not working, just erase it. Erase it and adjust it. But again, like I said earlier, know why you're erasing it. It's too high, it's too low, tilted too far to the left or right. What is the, what is the misalignment? What is the adjustment that's needed? Double check. So yeah, it's in now. Right now I've got the stem in my drawing lining up a little bit to the left of the corner. Let's see if I have that in the actual setup. And it is. So again, that's a confirmation that I'm starting to measure and go in the correct direction. Okay. So as I go forward, let me zoom in a little bit more to the drawing. As I go forward, I'm going to be doing all the measurements I just talked about. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you which one I'm doing, but I'm not going to necessarily constantly hold up my hand. Um, or maybe I will. I'm just quickly doing it with my pencil. And for the first few drawings that you're going to do, my advice is this. Spend about 45 minutes per drawing. And if it doesn't get finished and accurate in 45 minutes, that's fine. Because our objective in these first few drawings is to get a practice at applying these measurements. I'm not concerned with these perfectly rendered out drawings at this stage. Later on I will be. But right now my main concern is that you understand how to, how to clearly and effectively apply this approach to resolving your drawing. So I can see a lot from an unfinished drawing. So if you do some measurements in 45 minutes and you look at your drawing and you go, oh, it's, 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 it's so far from being finished, don't worry about it. My, my objective right now is to find out what you're understanding, what you're not understanding. So don't think that it's necessarily gonna you know, take some big hit because 
you might have your grade's going to necessarily take a big hit right from the get get, uh, get go just because you didn't finish the the first few drawings perfectly. I want to know what problems you have so I can give you effective advice because the advice I give you might be different than the advice I give to a different person. And you might be running into a problem that's different than the reason somebody else ran into a problem. So, and I can see that in an unfinished drawing. So again, this area I'm just gradually building up. I'm not worried right now about all the little sections. I will get to those. Okay. I can tell that needs to come over a little bit. That vertical I did earlier was just a bit off. And there's a spot right here. I'm going to point it out on the actual right there where the back edge is overlapping with the pepper. That's a landmark just like the corner can be a landmark. So that's what I'm thinking about as I block this in. Any shape on your drawing can be a landmark. Any shape in your still life can be a landmark. Top of the pepper until it goes over, projects down, and projects down there. And I know this is going to be rounded, but I'll round it off after I've figured out and resolved the basic structure. So be patient with yourself. I'll probably you'll say that a lot throughout the entire semester. Probably can't say it enough. But what I'm not worrying about right now is whether this drawing looks pretty or not. I can worry about that later on. I focus on my fundamentals, my my angles, my horizontal and vertical relationships, and all of all of the believability will take care of itself. If I start judging it too soon about whether it looks good or not, then I'm going to have problems. And what I'm doing right now relates to a lot of different types of drawing. If we were doing life drawing and drawing a model, we would still be doing this. Except obviously we'd be doing it off of anatomical references like the patella, the clavicle, you know, the chromium process in the, in, the, in the shoulders, issues like that. But it's still seeing how things relate, how forms and shapes relate. So if I go from, let's say, here to the end of that stem, Slight diagonal, end of the stem to that corner, just to hit the stem, just a touch to the right past it. Again, where those two measurements meet up, now I've just clarified the stem and I've just adjusted a previous measurement. So I always start this knowing that some of the measurements I do in the beginning are just in the ballpark, they're approximate. I'm working towards them. And if you can accept that from the get-go, that you're drawing is a series of approximations that gradually work to your finish that it'll be a lot less stressful than it needs to be. It's already going to be hard enough as it is. You don't want to give yourself you know, more stress than is needed. So another thing, and I talked about this earlier, this um, uh, pepper is sort of a box-like form in the sense that here's one side and then here's another side. That edge right there is there, that uh, highlight is there because we have a form change one side to another side. So I'm going to interpret the directional shifts of that shape to help me break down to the organic form of this uh, pepper relative to here. I'm going to do a similar thing as we get to the sections of the uh, pumpkin. Right? As far as what you set up at home to draw, you should have at least three objects and my advice is that one of the objects should be a geometric object of some type. Uh, a box. Do not use a, an elliptical object, meaning a, a, a a cup or anything like that. We're going to get to elliptical objects later on, but it should be a box-like form of some type. If you have an egg carton, we're going to have an egg carton assignment specifically coming up later, um, but that would be good. Just any kind of small little box. And one thing I'm doing is this point right here is going to line up. See there's a little dent, but there's two high points right here and here have a straight alignment with each other. And then it goes into that little dip, so I'm also checking those. And 
that's a little shift in the form right there. And I'm, like I said, I'm being selective. I'm not looking to tra draw every little tiny bit of texture. I'm looking to ask myself, what are the most dominant features of my subject that relate to that form, that movement of uh, uh, forms back into space? There's the end of the stem coming in. We have that section coming up. And you'll notice I'm just using my index finger and my thumb to bring in these shapes. And if I were to stop right now and notice that there's something that I measured earlier that was way off, the angle was I noticed was somehow doing something like this or like that, then I'd stop and change it, right? So again, don't if you, if you find something off, that's just change it. The more important thing is knowing it's there and then thinking of a strategy of what would be the best approach to adjust it. And the more you do this, the more you'll be able to eventually, again, it's, few years down the line, but the more you'll be able to do it with your eyes without holding up a stick. I, I do realize that holding up a stick can be very, very mechanical feeling. But the more you do it, the more fluid it's going to become. Okay? And the only real way to do that, to get kind of this fluid feel of it, is just to do it. Like I say, it's like playing an instrument. The only way you can get really fast at hitting the, the strings on a guitar is just to practice them over and over and over again. Same thing with piano or any other instrument. It's that kind of, kind of thing. The way it becomes automatic thinking is just by forcing yourself to practice it and then it becomes this thing that's an automatic way of visual thinking in your mind. So now I'm starting to get to the smaller shapes. Now I'm holding the pencil a little bit different. And I'm not worried about line weight for your drawings in this first one. Right now my main concern is just these issues of measuring. I will be having a, an assignment in another demo that adds line weight to the, to the, to the list. So it's just, remember, think of everything we're doing as one topic leading into the next. We have one set of issues or topics and concepts we're dealing with. And then we just add to that list as we go from one, one uh, set of drawings to the next. So... The issue of line weight is something that we will get into, but right now I first want to make sure that you understand how to thoroughly and clearly measure your subject matter. If I throw everything at you at once, it's going to be overwhelming. Right now I just want to focus on gesture and measure. These are lines I've already measured out. And now I can very carefully, and again, I'm keep making sure my pencil is staying sharp. I can round off these lines. And now that I've measured things out, I can start to erase as needed some of my measurement lines. So they don't become a distraction. In just a second, I'm going to go over a few things not to do.
can see, to get really all these directional shifts really specific, you have to be in front of your subject matter from life, not from a photograph which can distort and obscure a lot of things that are really important in the whole decision-making process. Like I say, you're solving a problem. I need to make this believable as the illusion of some three-dimensional quality to a flat piece of paper. And I'm editing out, let me reinforce this. You can notice here I'm editing out the, the light and shadow. We'll deal with light and shadow later on. Right now I'm just thinking of proportions, structure, alignment. Um, so you can, when I say something like perspective, for example, this setup is at a very specific eye level to me. And in just a minute I'm going to show you something to kind of clarify what I mean, how things change, but just as, a, as an intro to that, if this block were lower down, in other words, if I were looking down at this block and it was farther below my eye level, these angles would be much more extreme. And that's probably the most common problem people make when it comes to angle measuring, especially in the beginning, is that they take something that they know to have a, a broad top to it, for example, this box, they see it like this, which in this case you can only see a tiny little sliver of this top, but they draw it like that. And they draw it like that because their subconscious is taking over and they're no longer really paying attention to what they are, they're observing in front of them. Or if they only see a little sliver of it like this, they draw it like this, where you don't see any of it. But if the, dry, if the box is set up like that to us, um, we only see a tiny bit of the top. Even though I know the top might be longer than what I'm seeing from here to here, it's foreshortened. So the example I give a lot of times in, in, in the regular class is, if this is our stick that we know to be very long, you can notice as I start to change this and start turning it, making it more and more foreshortened, it starts to look like the back and the front are getting closer to one another. So the distance on a piece of paper would be very short from the back to the front. Even though I know the object is like this, so I have to pay attention to uh, what I see, and this goes to interpreting uh, that three-dimensional transition to two dimensions. I have to draw what I'm seeing based on my perspective not draw what I think the draw, what the object should be. So if I know, for example, there's a back corner to this box, which there is, I don't want to start pulling it up and drawing the back corner. I don't see the back corner because of the way the pumpkin is positioned. So draw the relationships that we see so it's believable, okay? Um, so if I give you feedback when you're drawing and I say your angles and your perspective is, is skewed, what it probably is referring to, and I'll, I'll clarify this in the feedback, but just so you're aware, it probably be referring to the angles are shifting in a direction that isn't consistent with a type of perspective uh, that would be you would see logically uh, from life. Okay, um, and also my alignments. Again, I'm making sure things align properly. And when I say sh specific shape, you can see now I've got if I draw some little arrows here, very specific directions for each turn in this form. So I haven't drawn this pepper, for example, like that. Yeah, it is kind of curving, but it's curving in very specific directions. The pumpkin, for example, I haven't drawn it, even though I'm rounding it off a little bit now, I haven't drawn it like this. That's a generalized form. That's not what the pumpkin is doing. It has a, that's a very, very broad, loose interpretation of it, because it's really being more specific. You can see these curves are coming up, changing a very specific direction over, and then curving in another specific direction downward towards that stem. So when I say generalized shape versus specific shape, this is what I'm referring to. Okay. Um, the other thing, and even though I know I talked about, and I'm not going to get overly concerned with line weight at this stage, later I will, make sure that you're drawing, you don't draw with heavy dark lines. So do not start the drawing, like let's imagine for a minute, let me move this down. Let's imagine this is a sheet of paper that we're drawing on. Do not start the drawing by going slowly around the edge of the object. Because when you do that, you're thinking in terms of tiny sections of your subject matter number one, which means you're not looking at the broader whole relationship first, and you're also drawing this hard, dark, generalized line of the outer contour. I want to think of this as a whole big, a large setup, gradually working my way to the small uh, points. Plus, here I have no gesture drawing in this particular example up here. I'm going slowly part by part. I want to think whole to the parts, okay, rather than the parts to the whole. So it's like I'm getting my 
large framework and then gradually adding things and correcting things within that framework. All right. So if I give you feedback and I say you're, you look like you're doing things too many, too too much in a part by part approach, this would be what I'm referring to, where you're kind of thinking as just tiny little parts rather than trying to think of this as a broad whole setup. So rewind back to the beginning when I blocked in this uh, gesture drawing, you'll notice like I was thinking of this larger whole mask quickly uh, moving back and forth as opposed to worrying about perfection and accuracy right at the get-go. We worked our way up to accuracy. Okay. Um, so uh, as far as uh, the rest of this goes, um, this is what, what I want you to stick with now. We'll get into some other issues later on. For the drawing you set up at home, my advice is pick three objects, have two of them be somewhat organic, and then one be geometric, a box shape of some kind. Um, and if you're not sure whether you've set the still life up uh, accurately, send me a, a, a picture of what you're thinking of putting together, how you're thinking of putting it together. I can give you feedback. Um, but use the reference that we have, you know, here in, in, in this example that we're working from. Something along these lines is what you're thinking about setting up with. And I want you to spend about 45 minutes on it. If you don't resolve everything in 45 minutes, that's fine. After that 45 minutes, maybe take a break for 5 or 10 minutes and then do another drawing, okay? And in the email, I've specified how many drawings I want you to do uh, uh, per session, per, per day when I give you these assignments. Um, but in the beginning, I want you to spend roughly 45 minutes. I will let you know as we move from one project to the next that we're going to expand out the amount of time you spend. But right now, I just want you to just practice this over and over and over again, not worrying about perfection in your drawing, but worrying about understanding, applying these issues of measuring, these issues of gesture. And then, as like I said, as we go forward, We'll have more time on a drawing. We'll work it up to a further level of completion. Um, but you can't really do that until you really firmly grasp how to apply these issues, okay? So if there's anything that I've covered in this that does not make sense, you have any questions about anything, let me know and I will send you some feedback and we can have a Zoom meeting if necessary and I'll try to clarify um, um, anything you're struggling with, all right? Okay, so real quickly before we're done, I want to reinforce this issue I talked about with perspective and how things change as you move. So we can see we have a cube sort of like the setup that we have with the pumpkin and the pepper. But watch what happens as I go higher above the cube. My eye level starts going up. You'll notice the angles here and here and here. Really all the angles of that box start looking different. If I go down, I go farther towards the ground plane. See, and now here's the little bit I see of the top of the box. Go down a little bit further. Now I don't see any of it. I'm getting almost on the ground. So I've got subtle angles because I'm so far on the ground. I go higher up. On the other hand, those angles get wider and wider and wider, greater and greater, I should say, uh, as, as I go farther away. Um, so keep that in mind. Where, where my positioning is relative to my subject um, uh, is going to dictate how some of those angles are going to work. So if I'm seeing the box like this, I don't want to draw it like that where I have a lot at the top. As I get closer and it gets closer to my eye level, I see less and less and less of the top. And those angles get more subtle as they get closer to an eye level. They get greater as they get farther away. So the only way to see really extreme angles in a box is you've got to be really, really high above it. It's got to be really below your eye level, which right now that's not what I want you to do. I want things, don't, things don't have to be on the eye level, but I don't want you to be standing you know, six feet above your setup. Okay? A foot or two above your setup, that's okay. You know, maybe a foot and a half, a foot or so. But going farther than that right now, I don't want you to do that. So keep that in mind. As things move, you'll notice the perception of that shape is going to change because your positioning to the subjects is changing, even though the physical subject itself is not changing, okay?